UK bus crashes into the square after two-vehicle collision with an investigation underway. UK's College of Nursing celebrates community with its annual chili cook-off. Gunfire near UK campus sparks alert confusion bullet holes found in building. UKPD to increase safety measures, access to be limited for parking on campus. And the 2024 presidential election. I'm Gianna Gallo. And I'm Owen Chesmore, and this is Catching Up with the Colonel. The opinions expressed on this podcast are the speaker's own and don't uphold the opinions expressed by the Kentucky Colonel. A University of Kentucky bus crashed into the square located in downtown Lexington, Kentucky on the night of October 31st. Just after midnight on Friday, the bus crashed into Urban Outfitters after a collision with a white car. Following the crash, heavy police presence was on scene, directing traffic and blocking the area from bystanders. The crash resulted in road closures on West Main Street as well as North Broadway. This is also an ongoing story. I have so many questions about this. I got <laughs> this uh, alert from our newsroom. I got the picture and I was like, oh my goodness. I mean, you can see from this picture, the whole back of the bus is disastrous. It's mm -hmm. gone. So I'm curious, what was the accident? Is Was it a rear end? Was it a drunk driver? Mm -hmm. Is the driver okay? Mm-hmm. Were there people on the bus? Yes, it was midnight, but like he could have been making a nice stop for someone if they were pl a pleasant bus driver. Right. So many questions. Will we get an update? Who knows? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, it definitely is just, yeah, it looks really bad <laughs> in terms of the crash and also just worried about what the driver might be feeling. I mean, after this experience, um, but also it's just important that like transportation is so vital right now at terms of like late at night. So making sure that we like properly address what happened, if there's any safety concerns or concerns for driving at this time, like we make sure we get it gets addressed. Yeah, I completely agree. I'm curious too if, well, because again, I hope Urban Outfitters is okay. I have to drive past it one of these days to see what the damage mm -hmm. looks like. Because again, a bus rolling into a building, I think the right. bus will probably do more damage than the building will. Um, I, I'm just hoping that everyone's okay. Again, there was very little information with this story, but I agree with you with um, transportation. Again, I think UK is taking the initiative to expand their transportation and extend their hours. Um, I don't know if there's actually, I don't feel like there was a route ever going downtown to Lex, like downtown Lexington. So I feel like maybe it was going back to like the station or the hub or whatever mm -hmm. the bus place is. Um, I just, I don't, I hope, I, I just hope everyone's okay. <laughs> yeah, me too. I mean, there's a lot of room for like speculating, but I mean, I think the key point is that it happened the night of Halloween. And so I, I do wonder if that had something to do with it and whether the drivers are truly, who are on the road that night, obviously not the UK one, but other drivers are being responsible. The University of Kentucky's College of Nursing Wellness Council hosted its annual chili cook-off at the College of Nursing building. Participants were able to showcase their chili on October 24th, with judges basing their decisions on the flavor and spices to determine who would be this year's winner. The College of Nursing's Wellness Council hopes that through events like this, like the chili cook-off, members of the college will be able to de-stress and feel a sense of belonging on campus. After the judge's deliberation, Human Resources and Faculty Resource Coordinator at the College of Nursing, Cynthia Fentress, was announced as the winner of the 2024 Annual College of Nursing Chili Cook-Off. Gianna, do you, are you a fan of chili and would you be enjoying this event? Yes, let me go on a chili <laughs> rant. Yes, please do. <laughs> I love chili so much. It's one of my favorite meals. Reminds me of fall. Mm -hmm. I feel like Kentucky Mother Nature is kind of tricking us right now with this weather. Mm -hmm. So a bowl of chili will just get me in the fall and winter mindset and right. like turn on the UK football game, even if they do lose all the time. But I love chili. I wish our college did this. Or like, I wish that the chili was on display. Like, I want to try Cynthia's chili. Right, me too. That if sounds delicious. Won, if it won out of X amount of chilies, I want to try it. I agree. Or so Cynthia, come over. Like, make me a bowl of chili. What exactly. Do you put it? Tell me your secret recipe. Exactly. 
UKPD will increase safety measures on campus and access will be limited for parking on campus. Starting this weekend, UKPD will deploy extra officers on, quote, bike, foot, and vehicle to patrol the North Campus area from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. on Fridays and Saturdays, which will be in addition to the current patrolling officers, according to the email. There will also be additional, quote, large temporary floodlights installed on Winslow Street. UKPD is currently assessing where permanent lighting, cameras, and emergency towers need to be installed around the area. Limited access to garages and parking lots at the Cornerstone, Sports Center Garage, and Good Samaritan Hospital will be enforced according to this email. According to the University of Kentucky uh, spokesperson Jay Blanton, the Cornerstone garage gates will stay down over the weekend as they do on weekend nights or weekday nights. Permit holders, including those with off-peak and periphery permits, so that be RK, CK, and EK, can access the garage from 3.30 p.m. Friday to 5 a.m. Monday. Blanton said visitors will need to pay. The garage will no longer be free for guests on the weekend. Students with K-Lot parking passes who have to move their cars to surrounding parking structures on home football game, game days will be able to access the garage with their permits, according to Blanton. What do you think about all these different changes <laughs> that we just went over? What do you think spurred them on in making this decision? And do you think it's the right one to make? Let me just take a deep breath first, because this is a lot. Yeah. This is a lot to talk about. Um, I My first question is like, okay, you're adding more, but I thought you already did that last time. Mm -hmm. And you did that the time before. Mm -hmm. And you kept adding things and adding things. And now there's even more now? How many police are going to be on campus? Because I still don't see any. Right. Maybe I'm just in the wrong part of town or the wrong part of campus. Yeah. I don't see any. Right. I don't. I. Who are these allied universal people? Mm -hmm. I don't know. We don't know. I don't know who they yeah. are. Oh, I do. Thankfully, I know what they wear. I've never seen one before. Mm -hmm. And I've had several late nights in the library. Um, I was going to say I've been to the library as well. I don't see anyone like patrolling. I mean, maybe they're there, but I wouldn't know. Uh, yeah, exactly. I wouldn't know. And especially this event that happened uh, off campus, mm -hmm. but a block away from campus. And again, let's reiterate from the whole late night episode that happened where um, the owner had to take down its sign. UK owns those grounds. The Cornerstone Garage, garage is owned, is, the property is owned by UK. The building is not. So even though it wasn't, the, the bullets didn't go on the grounds, it went through Cornerstone, which isn't UK's, it should still be addressed. And it should technically, in my opinion, still be an on-campus shooting mm -hmm. because it is UK's grounds. But that's a discussion for another day. Um, I think there's several things that need to be accounted for especially the mishap in the text and phone call and message that got sent out at, I think, 1 o'clock in the morning when this event happened. The message sent out to students of the shooting alerted them, urgent shots fired in the location, above, avoid the area. Then, six minutes, six minutes later, there was an alert clarifying the location of the previous alert saying location of last UK alert is Winslow and Upper. Avoid the area. Hmm. I got four notifications at one in the morning. I was so upset because my phone just kept buzzing and my emails kept going off. This is something you don't mess up, UKPD, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially when it's a block off of campus where residents live. Mm -hmm. I, I, I guess I'm just real. If you haven't noticed Owen <laughs> yeah I'm very furious about this I think UK has been very irresponsible and they I don't see the change where is the 20 million dollars going because I thought last time you were supposed to be installing and updating the blue emergency towers mm -hmm. has that happened has that I happened mean... <laughs> and now you're going to install more well tell me where put it on a map and show me and also not to mention within these changes, we have something changing with like parking. And I'm like, 
that just has people upset now because they're like, wait, so this person has to pay for this and parking is expensive enough. So now people are even more upset. So I don't understand what's going well, on there. Could you imagine going right? Oh, oh, shoot. I forgot to move my car football game and it's midnight. Mm -hmm. Go to the Cornerstone Garage, swipe my pass that I didn't even think had a, has a barcode. I don't know how students are supposed to get in and it doesn't work because mm -hmm. UK didn't like hit the button of allowed into cornerstone then what happens then where do i park are you gonna pay for my parking like this is too many steps now right. this is way too many steps way too much ordering and directions it just should have been fixed also why are they just i'm gonna keep going with this no, because it's insane yeah. to me why are they only increasing security on north campus let's recall the last four sexual assaults happened on central campus Shelgren mm -hmm. Hall. Mm -hmm. Why is North Campus only going to be protected? I agree. I think this is a campus-wide issue. Maybe not where the gun violence is always taking place, but plenty of other issues are taking place inside and outside the dorms. And I think that means that police has to respond to that um, and make sure that they're patrolling all areas and that if someone reports something, that they can arrive very quickly. Yeah, and this shooting, again, luckily nobody was injured. There was a couple, there was damage done to the Cornerstone uh, eSports lounge area. Right. Um, but thankfully, no student or anybody was injured during this. I don't know who the potential gun person owner was mm -hmm. that did this. Um, will we get that notification? I don't know. I personally feel like it's time for an email to be sent that is a little bit more descriptive than the ones we've been getting. And I really think UKPD needs to do a little bit of a reality check. Yeah. And really needs to stop saying we're doing more and show me that you're doing more. Because yeah. you can keep saying it, but until until I see action, then I, I, I'll stop complaining. Right. <laughs> Especially when we're seeing videos, I mean, of what happened at Canes. And it's just like the psychological impact on people who like had to run out of there like afraid for their lives. Like it's a very like real thing that's happening on campus. And a lot of other issues that we don't always see happen at such a big level, but that are happening nonetheless, like the assaults that you're talking about. So I think we need to definitely address this quickly and have more transparency about the changes that we're making. I completely agree. Like you said, now it's four sexual assaults, two off campus, but a block away from campus shootings. It's time for the university to step up and take charge of what is going on in their campus. On Tuesday, November 7th, Americans elected 47th President Donald J. Trump to office. In this segment, we're going to be doing a little bit of a, an analysis on this election that just happened, our personal uh, experience with it, and working for the colonel as a student journalist, um, because this is an election I definitely will never forget because I was working in our newsroom and it was crazy so let's start off with some numbers and let's talk about this map a little bit so yeah. um as we can see right now current uh current day which is friday november 8th trump has won with uh 295 harris has 266 Nevada and Arizona are still waiting on all the votes but most likely leaning conservative towards trump um what let's talk about the 2020 election you have mm -hmm. the map pulled up yes, what do. states do you see immediately that were blue last year that turned red the swing states because i think that was a, the biggest part of this election right there were one two three four five six seven of them mm -hmm. what were blue last year so first of all i mean we have um arizona these states down here that are leaning red which last year were leaning towards much more towards biden they voted overall towards Biden. Um, and then we have states like Georgia that swung red this season, as well as other swing states um, that were really up for grabs this year. I mean, I think that a lot of people went into this election not knowing which direction the swing states would be going for, but um, a lot of them went red, as we can see, um, which really made the difference in this election versus the last one. Yeah, I mean, my personal guess on this was I 
thought Harris was going to win Wisconsin and Michigan, since mm-hmm. those have larger cities. Uh, and they voted, I believe, blue in the last election, if you can. Yes, yeah. that's correct. So I thought it was going to be a little bit of a trend to uh, continue li- voting blue and liberal. Uh but I know, again, swing states, so they had a history with going back and forth. I thought Harris had that, those two states, though. Um, and I thought that Trump would swing the rest. I, North Carolina, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada, I thought he would get those. And I truly thought it was going to be a really close race mm-hmm. and truly up to Pennsylvania because I was looking in past elections and it really did go back and forth. Sometimes voted red, sometimes voted blue. It wasn't a consistent thing. So I really thought, though, I think they had 19 electoral college votes and I really thought that would declare who the president was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I. What about you? Did you have any swing states that you thought ca- the either candidate would definitely pick yeah i mean i i guess i had a similar analysis to you where i thought um i was thinking that pennsylvania would swing towards um harris and other swing states like that based on the previous election um or the previous elections um but based on the results obviously that wasn't the case and so that was surprising to me but once again i mean i didn't have a lot of expectations going into this because I feel like every single day I was like, no, this person's going to win. And the next day I was like, no, it's going to be this person. So I really don't think it was clear until the election day who was going to win. Yeah, and you have a really good point that I I didn't really realize until we were talking about this, the voter turnout. We had been talking on multiple episodes about voting, how to vote, 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 vote. And now we finally see the votes up here. This also, this image is from the Associated Press that we're using. Um, But Donald Trump has 73 million, which is about 53.7% votes. Harris has 69 million, Mm -hmm. almost 40%. 47.7% 47.7% people. What did the 2020 election look like? What is the difference? How do you feel the turnout was for voters? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the previous election, there was a massive difference, like a massive difference in voter turnout. So this election, we had Democrats with um, around 69 million voters. And last election, we had 81 million, a bit over 81 million with Biden. Um, and then as well, with the Republicans, Um, Trump won this election with a little bit over 73 million votes, but lost the previous election with a bit over 74 million votes, which is really interesting. So a big difference in voter turnout, especially for Democrats, I would say. I mean, the Republicans, uh, the Republican voter turnout remains the same, but for Democrats, it was a big difference. And I know that uh, Robert Kennedy, he... Mm -hmm endorsed Trump and then Mm -hmm. wanted to get off the ballot. But even Green Party and Independent got votes, too. Mm -hmm. Jill Stein got um, like 60 or 66 or uh, quite a lot. 0.5 percent. Yeah. She didn't get any electoral votes. Even Kennedy, though, got a a got um, votes. 0.4 percent. And he's not even in this election. And you had as well as the Libertarian candidate had a decent Mm -hmm. amount of voters. So I think that's interesting, like maybe there's like there's a clear, maybe not causation here, but like a rise in people who are voting third party and a connection to low voter turnout might be that people are just not as passionate this election about um, who the Democrats and Republicans are running. I completely agree. I feel like uh, when the inauguration quickly approaches and when we finally get the results of the election and every ballot has been counted, I would be curious to see the final numbers of all of the voters and maybe an analysis of like, why did, didn't did a lot of people vote? I feel like that's a really good question that needs to be answered. And is there a trend? Is it just because people didn't like either candidate, their campaigns? Um, I think this is very interesting. I also want to bring up Let's talk about the House and the Senate, too. Also, right, this is another picture from AP Press uh, updated today, Friday. We have for the House, 199 Democrats, 211 Republicans, 25 to be called. You have to get to 218. Um, For Senate, I don't know if you can see this past my head, but um, you have 45 Democrats, 53 Republicans, Um, two to be called, you have to get to 50. Um, So obviously we're leading or 
Republicans are leading both in the House and the Senate Mm -hmm. and the Supreme Court. Yes. So the White House, the Supreme Court, the Senate, the House. I think it's interesting, too. It notes the flipped seats. Mm -hmm. And when you have four there for Republicans, so the Republicans were very successful with the voter turnout this election. I mean, clearly they won in all these different areas. Yeah, I'll be curious too, again, when this all kind of like two years go by and how this will really impact our economy too, because Mm -hmm. I don't know off the top of my head, but I wanna know when was the last time we had a same party, House, Senate, just you know justice system and president right was there a chance was there a time where it was all liberal at one point I, mm-hmm. i'm just curious like as a historian like i'm just curious of like right when when was that because obviously yes we're very young and we have this was our first election that we voted right. in but there wasn't a time in our lives where everything was red or everything was blue Yeah. And that raises questions about like checks and balances or what it's going to be like with a kind of one party system kind of controlling these multiple um, parts of our government. But also, I mean, it's interesting to think about Kentucky specifically because we had Kentucky obviously or unsurprisingly went red in this election as it did in the previous election. Um, But it was interesting what happened to the amendments because we had two amendments on the ballot this time. We had Amendment 1 and Amendment 2. one which was about the first one which was about voting which i think there is a lot less conversation about but then voting the second amendment which is about school choice did have a lot of engagement in this election um amendment one was passed but then amendment two people voted no on generally Mm -hmm. Um, i think it was like a bit above 60 percent on both so that was really interesting and amendment three about park tax also Mm -hmm. passed too okay so Two passed, one got the no go, mm-hmm. um, and I, I agree. I think of Amendment Two. I mean, I understand why Lexington ha- or Kentucky has a large family population. A lot of people obviously have children, um, so I understand why Amendment Two got so much fame. Um, but I remember just driving the streets of Lexington, and a lot of homes said "vote no for two, vote no for two. And I was I was just surprised that like no what what about Amendment Three and what about Amendment One like right I get it Amendment Two is important um, to some but what about these other ones and what was also interesting is obviously Republican or Kentucky goes Republican but I think these amendments were kind of like put in terms of like a party like one party is going to vote this but one party is going to vote that but Amendment Two like in a state that obviously goes towards Republicans or uh, votes more Republican, also voted against Amendment 2, which is in favor of the public school system or funding the public school system, which was a very interesting result from this election. Yeah, I also want to to look at this map, too, that Kentucky was the first state to be announced. Be called. Be called, yes. Um, Which... I'm like, yay, Kentucky for voting. Like, <laughs> exactly. Woo, I'm glad we were the first. It was like kind of weird. I was like, oh my gosh, we're the first state to be called. Right. Um, but it wasn't surprised that we were red. I I have a prediction though. Call me crazy. Mm-hmm. Call me crazy. I see very far, far, far away in the in the years that Kentucky might become a swing state, mm-hmm. especially with Andy Brashear, with Louisville, with Lexington. We have two very large cities that are liberal, voted liberal in, you know, the little county detailed map. I think eventually, with time, possibly Kentucky might come a swing state. Um, It's been red for a very, very long time. But I wasn't, I was kind of surprised with the voter turnout of like, this is how many people voted uh, Republican. This is how many people voted Democrat. Um, Because I think it was like a 60-40 ratio which Mm -hmm. i thought it was going to be like 70 30 or 80 you know just a very vast diverse far long um turnout but um yeah kentucky was the first one to be called yeah this was just it was a crazy election let's talk about our experiences too where were you on election day were you voting what were you feeling what were you watching Yeah, so I actually drove back to Louisville the day before or the night before, and then I woke up at like 5.30 a.m., went to vote, um, and I got there, 
around six and I voted so very early, like as soon as it opened. And by the time I left, the line was like three times as long. Wow. So I was like so glad I got there early, first of all, because I was like, <laughs> that would have been a long wait. <laughs> Just but to check a box. <laughs> I know I was looking on social media and a lot of people were like, even if it closes, like stay in line, it's mm. your right to stay in line. So a lot of people were very engaged, at least the people I know with this election. So um, especially like in my experience among young voters, I know that there's a lot of interest in this election and a lot of engagement. Yeah, I was in our newsroom. I didn't stay all night because I was like, I can't, I can't do this. <laughs> you need I'm, sleep. I need sleep. And <laughs> yeah. I was just, I turned on different news channels. I kept flipping through them and just seeing all of the journalists on TV and just thinking like, oh my goodness, I just did that for four hours, let alone you're there for over 24 hours, like constantly going and constantly talking and analyzing and bringing in new results. It's just, I'm exhausted for them. And I was surprised that we got a candidate called that or that morning yeah i guess i was anticipating thursday or saturday kind of waiting a longer time for the results to come in but when i woke up and i checked my phone i was like oh my gosh we know the next president mm -hmm. that's insane to me um but yeah i was in our newsroom working on uh, my team stuff for broadcast and it was just like so surreal like I was thinking in my head I'm 20 years old reporting on like na nationwide news that's going to affect me that's going to affect other students UK everyone which is just like so weird that this is such like a nationwide thing I don't know it just like makes me think on a bigger spectrum like right this is nationwide news this isn't UK campus news um so it was, it was a great experience, but it wore me out. <laughs> it's like, and election's over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we'll, I guess we'll wait for Nevada and Arizona to be officially be called. But again, um, 47th president of the United States is Donald J. Trump. Well, that episode was quite a doozy, but we hope that you enjoyed it. And if you want to gather any more information about these articles, be sure to check out kykernel.com. Follow us on all social media platforms. That's X, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Spotify. Thanks for catching up with The Colonel. We'll see you next week.